I'm Alan. If you don't know who I am, I'm one of the pastors here. And no, I don't be turning up. I'm just, you know, I just was joking. Uh, but anyway, uh, welcome to Life Church. I'm glad that you are here. I hope that you are enjoying yourself already. We are in the third week of our series, Game Changers. I really would encourage you, if you have not, uh, if you weren't here the first couple weeks, that you go to the website or go to the app and you hear the first two uh, lessons on Game Changer. And what you saw in this video was an example of a person who elevated their game and in such a way that because of that elevation, they had a game change. It changed the fortune of that sporting event. And the same can be said about prayer. Because prayer is that game change. Often, we don't think about it as the game changer. But prayer, done well, done according to scripture, can change your fortunes forever. And so we're going to be talking about that over the next couple uh, more weeks, two more weeks. But I have a lot to talk about right now. So before I get into it, let's pray. Father, thank you so much for giving me an opportunity to, to be here and to speak what you have given me. And my prayer, Father, is that you would open our hearts so that we can see what you have to say to us and give us a heart so that we can apply what you have to say to us. It's so important, Father, for us not to be just hearers of the word, but also doers of the word. That makes a game change. We thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. So we're going to talk about something today that uh, really is a cuss word. Uh, yeah, I'm going to be unpacking what many of us think is a cuss word, and that's discipline. Yeah. And yeah, most of us don't want to even talk about the subject of discipline, especially as it relates to prayer, because what we want to do in prayer is just have our Hail Mary prayers. We basically pray when things get tough and we say, God, help me. Or those prayers that we do when we are driving down the road. You know, we, we get up in the morning, we're running late, and, and oh, I have not prayed. Let me get in this car and let, let me listen to 102.7, and that makes me start praising. And, and. But the truth is, what I have come to believe, and it's going to be the argument of what I'm going to be talking about. I'm going to argue this very, very simple point, and that is that in order to uh, a, a, a disciplined prayer life, a disciplined, routined Prayer life enhances the, uh, the, the chance of, ha of experiencing a game changer in your life. A disciplined prayer life increases our chance for a game changer. And so my hope as we talk today is that we learn and realize that, that God has a plan and he has a way of effectively praying and oftentimes what God wants from us is to be consistent in talking to him not just when we're driving but shutting things out all of the noise carving out time so that we can sit in his presence to talk that seems to be a value of God and my hope at the end of this service that it will become a value for you in order to support that argument, I'm going to be talking about three things. Number one, uh, what does a disciplined prayer life accomplish? What does a disciplined prayer life accomplish? Again, I'm att attempting to support this argument that a disciplined prayer life increases our chance for a game change. Number two, what is the reason for a disciplined prayer life? And finally, what is the benefit of a disciplined prayer? prayer life. We're going to answer these questions by looking at one passage, and the passage is in Daniel chapter 6. And in Daniel chapter 6, we're going to be reading a lot of verses, probably about 22 verses, to get the sense of who Daniel is and uh, be able to look at those questions and answer them as we go on. But before I get into it, I want you to, to think about Daniel. Maybe you haven't read about Daniel, but Daniel was uh, a character in the 6th century. He was uh, born in the 6th century, uh, maybe in the late, uh, maybe in the 6th century. And uh, while he was living, he was kidnapped by the Babylonians. He was kidnapped by the Babylonians and brought to Babylon. 
Now, I, I got to make it even uh, more clear for us. Uh, the Babylonians decided that they were going to build a siege around Jerusalem and Judah. And they were not going to allow any food coming in and no one can get out. And they were going to make sure that, uh, that the, the, the populace or the, the population within the, uh, Judah and Jerusalem would starve. And, and their, their whole idea was if they are st starving, they will be weak. And they did. They did it for several days. And then they marched in and killed hundreds of thousands of people. And hundreds of thousands of people were carted off as prisoners of war. Daniel was one of them. Daniel probably undoubtedly saw the death of his parents and friends and families and neighbors. And he was carted off to be a prisoner of war. His temple was destroyed so that his religion, which was connected to his temple, was also destroyed. They gave him, the Babylonians gave him a new name, Belshazzar. And so can you imagine the, 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 the intense uh, trouble that Daniel was in? Yeah, when I look at this person, Daniel, as I read through the whole 12 chapters, one thing I see, and it blows my mind, and that is in the midst of fierce trouble, da Daniel, instead of complaining, instead of walking away, instead of having a crisis of faith, Daniel leaned in hard to know God. In the midst of his trouble, Daniel, instead of uh, turning away from God, he elevated his relationship with God. And when he did that, he too was elevated. I think that's instructive for us because often uh, we can have a, a, a hangnail and we, it changes our pattern. I mean, talk, I talk to so many people who, who uh, they, they, they've gone to the church and they've been consistent, and then something happens in their life, and I stopped seeing them for several months, and then, they, then I bust, bump into them, and I'm saying, so, so what's up? What, what you doing right now? Well, I'm just uh, going through something. I'm going through something. They have trouble and they, 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 they no longer serve in church or serve those who are in need or read the Bible or pray or give to God's kingdom because they have trouble. That It changes their pattern, but not Daniel. When Daniel was going through what? This trouble that was extremely intense, what did he do? He didn't run, but he elevated his faith and his faithful relationship with God. He wanted to know God more in his trouble. That's something that we need to be thinking about, what we do. And I really believe, and I think that Daniel knew this, that trouble is oftentimes orchestrated by God so that he can tell, see how you respond to trouble. So the question is, well, how are you responding to trouble? That's free. That's not really a part of the sermon. You don't have to pay for that one. So what we're going so so fast forward, uh, Daniel was elevated because his faithfulness to God. He was elevated as the supervisor over the wise man. And then years later, he is probably eighty-five years old. Uh, Daniel got another elevation. The king at this time was a guy named Darius, and the king at that time wanted to elevate Daniel so that he would be the ruler of the known world. But how many of you know that when you get elevated, especially among your peers, there are haters? How many of you know about that crab in the barrel syndrome? That when you're going up, the crab, the crab at the bottom will pull you down so that you don't elevate? How many of you have experienced that, that when you are, are, are excellent in the things that you do in the, in the eyes of the peers, even if you're in middle school, high school, or college, that people look at you and want to bring you down? Some of you, even right now, are experiencing haters who want to make sure that you are not elevated. You know what I'm talking about? And that's what we will see in this story as we answer those three questions. The story begins in chapter 6, verses 1 through 3. It says, it pleased Darius, the king, to appoint 120 satraps to rule throughout the kingdom with three administrators over them, one of whom was Daniel. The satraps were made accountable to them so that the king uh, might not suffer loss. Now Daniel so distinguished himself among the administrators and the satraps by his exceptional qualities that the king planned to set him over the whole kingdom. 
What's this satraps, satraps thing? Well, the satraps were governors over states, and the administrators were supervising the governors. Now, there were 120 governors that the three administrators were supervising to make sure that these governors were not having financial improprieties or, or, or any improprieties. And the king saw Daniel and said, man, I think that you should be over even the administrators and the governor. I think that you should be over my whole known world. And you got to know, as I said, when you get elevated, especially in Daniel's case, there are going to be a haters, especially a Daniel who is a foreigner, who is not native to that land. And God does that oftentimes, even when you're in the midst of a hostile environment and God's hand is on you, he will elevate you and, peep, and he will have his spirit on you and people will just not like it. That's exactly what hap happened in this story. In verse 4, it says, at this, or at, at, uh, when the, the, the king decided to elevate Daniel, at this, the administrators and the satraps tried to find grounds for charges against Daniel in his conduct of govern government affairs, but they were unable to do so. They could find no corruption in him because he was trustworthy and neither corrupt nor negligent. Guys, this blows my mind when I think about this because it sounds like a political saga, doesn't it? I mean, here you go. You, you see, you have to understand that, that Daniel was in politics. He was, in a sense, a politician. He worked in the government. And, and he had been in this position for a long time, and the governors were trying to figure out or unearth whatever they could to bring him down. Uh, the, 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 the governors were checking his emails and, and to see if he shared any sensitive materials. The governors were checking his university because Daniel had a Daniel University. And they, and they, they checked w whether he had been bilking a bunch of people. They could not find any. I uh, know he did not have and They didn't have emails. I got that. But they, they could not find anything wrong with Daniel. I don't understand that because if I tried to run for office at the age of five, they would have been able to bring me down. I'm just saying. This man, this man again, it, you got to put it in perspective here. He had been in Babylon as, uh, from 17 until about 85. So he had been there for 68 years. And you got to know, when you're in politics, people will try to unearth what they can as you know to bring that person down but for some reason Daniel lived beyond reproach and they could not get him at all it says something about his disciplined prayer life and you'll see as we go on but they tried a lot of things but there's one thing that they needed to try to bring Daniel down, it had to relate with his religious commitment. Verse 5 says, finally, these men said, we will never find any basis for charges against this man. Can you imagine? We will never. We tried hard, but he, he is squeaky clean. I, do you know a politician that's squeaky clean? Really? Seriously? I mean, I'm, I'm not going to tell you what they said. Somebody birded something out in the first service. I'm not going to get, you know, I got problems, so forget about that. <laughs> Daniel, the scripture says, uh, against this man Daniel, unless it has something to do with the law of his God. So, bless you. See, so, so what, what they wanted to do is to get Daniel to commit treason. So again, Daniel was a foreigner. He, he worshipped his own living God. And so they said, okay, he's different than us. So what I want them to do, I want him to do is I'm going to set up a law or I'm going to encourage the king to sign into law something that will cause him to, uh, to run against the law of Babylon. So what were they going to do? They had to figure out, what are we going to do? What are we gonna, how are we going to come up with this law? Oh, Eureka, I got it. I have a king who's full of himself. I got a king who thinks he's king awesomeness. 
And so I'm going to go to the king and I'm going to say, your, your highness, I really think that people should be worshiping you. In fact, you should put a law in place that rec recognize how incredible you are. That's exactly what happens. You'll see in verses 7 and 8, he says, the king should issue an edict and enforce the decree that anyone who prays to any god or, hu or human being during the next 30 days except to you, your majesty, shall be executed, thrown into the lion's den. They could not unearth anything in Daniel's life. So they thought, I know what I'm going to do. I'm going to get him to commit treason. And I'm going to appeal to this megalomaniac, this ego guy, egomaniac guy, this king. And I'm going to say, king, I'm going to, uh, I think because you're so awesome and you're so incredible that you should be God for 30 days. You should just take the position of God for 30 days. And you should make sure that everyone in your kingdom stops all of their religious services and they come to you, bow their knee, and pay homage to you and praise you. And people are going to do that but, but because they are afraid of losing their lives. But not Daniel. And before I get into it, I just want to pump my brakes for a minute and talk directly to you. How many of you will change your pattern when trouble comes? How many of you will change your pattern when you are faced with something, especially whether it's a mortal threat or even not that difficult? For instance, when you think about it, uh, how, how many of you, if you are around a person who does not believe in Jesus Christ and they are hostile against Jesus Christ, how, many, how often do you clam up and not say anything? How many of you, uh, when you are at a school and you're surrounded by students who don't even care about Jesus Christ, but when you are at church, you say, I'm a good Christian, but when you are at school, you act just like them? How many of you? See, that's the same type of concept. When you change your pattern based on the specific circumstance, the, the specific situation. If there was a law in this land that said hey, you cannot pray to any other God other than the president, and if you do, you would be executed, and if they had the wherewithal to actually see what you do, the question is, what would you do? Look at what Daniel did. Now, when Daniel learned that the decree had been published, he went home to, to his upstairs room where the windows opened toward Jerusalem. Three times a day, he got down on, the, on his knees and prayed, giving thanks to his God, just as he had done before. In other words, Daniel was not trying to make a political statement. We're not looking at civil disobedience here. He was not trying to, 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 to buck the system. When he says, as he did before, he simply did not change his pattern. Even though there was a mortal threat, even though he was going to be, he could be put to death. He says, I'm not going to change my pattern. I am simply going to bow my knee and give thanks to God. I know that I am in the midst of trouble. I know that I could be put to death. I know that I am surrounded by haters. But in the midst of these haters, I am going to say, thank you, God. I'm going to say, I'm thankful that you have given me breath. I'm thankful that you have given me life. I'm thankful that I have a window that I could open. I, I'm thankful, God, that you are my king and my God. I am thankful. He says, I'm not going to let any type of law to stop me from being grateful. We don't have to have those kinds of laws. And how many, do, how many times do we forget to be grateful, to say thanks? But as we see in this passage, Daniel had a pattern. He had this discipline, this routine of praying, and nothing was going to stop the pattern. Nothing was going to stop the pattern. Which leads me to the first question. What is accomplished by a disciplined prayer life? What is accomplished 
by a disciplined prayer life. I see this in the life of Daniel. I see the answer in the entire narrative of Daniel that something was accomplished because he, the fact that he was disciplined, that he had a routine, that he sat down and he decided that he was going to carve out time and push the noise out and pray. I tell you what I believe was accomplished. And that is to move one from an acquaintance to a fully devoted follower of the Lord. And this is what I'm trying to say. I think that what is accomplished when we are disciplined and routine in our prayer life, we don't just do it once a month, but we have a set time that we're going to spend with God. I think that what happens is our faith grows. Our faith in God grows. It's when we only have this, this type of prayer life that we pray one day and maybe, maybe we pray a month later. Uh, during that time, our faith doesn't typically grow. It's during that time that we simply have what is called a conceptual belief in God or a theoretical belief in God. And some people have a mythological belief in God. And the reason why they can't get beyond the concept is that they are not consistent in our prayer practice. But Daniel, throughout his life, he knew God. I know that he knew God because he was able to say thanks in the face of a mortal threat. I mean, think about it. If you had haters that were trying to bring you down, do you sit and praise God and say, thank you, God? Not for the haters, but in the midst of this. I know, God, that you are in all, you are in control. I know, God, that you work all things according to your will. I know, God, that you are working all things for good because I, am, I love you and I am called by your purpose. Do we do that? Because the only way that we would have that, that type of faith, let me say this very, very clear, clear, clearly. The only way that we will have that type of faith and that type of commitment to thank God in the midst of intense trouble, whatever it's, it's your marriage or your job or your money, the only way that you will be consistent in thanking God in the midst of trouble is you, you got to know God. You got to have a relationship with him. You have a deep, abiding relationship. And when you do that or when you keep company with God, there's something about keeping company with God. When you keep company with God, you begin to become just like God. We had our training camp uh, at Life Canton uh, yesterday, Friday and Saturday, and one of the speakers said something very interesting. He says, I can determine where a person, uh, person will be in their life, or I can determine the future of, another, of a person based on the company they keep. I can determine where you're going to go in life based on who you're hanging out with. Because, uh, because you, if you're in company that is corrupt, you will become corrupt. But because Daniel spent time meeting God on a consistent basis, he kept company with God, he, be, he began to love him. He began to be with him. He grew in him. He trusted him. He followed him. So if you think about what uh, discipline life accomplishes in our lives, we become truly uh, devoted, fully devoted followers of God. We move from an acquaintance or having this conceptual knowledge of God to a real knowing of him. And I tell you, this, so this is convicting to me. Because there are times in my life that I, where I'm not as consistent. And when I'm not as consistent, I'll sit down and, and I won't have this feeling of God being there. And I say, God, will, will you simply reveal yourself to me? Help me uh, get through what I was going through. Just reveal yourself to me. And what I realized in, in my prayer life, and it's true, it's almost like the Spirit spoke to my heart and said, I'm not going to do it because you know why? You only come to me when you need something. You don't come consistently. I'm the God of all gods. I'm the creator of the universe. Do you know who you're dealing with? And you only come as if I'm a lucky's, lucky rabbit's foot. I want to love you. 
I want a relationship with you. And when you come consistently and you, have a, you carve out time, then you'll find yourself moving from acquaintance to a fully devoted God follower of the Lord. Second question we're going to answer as we looked at these other verses, verses 11 through 12. These men, this, we're about to see what took place. These men went as a group and found Daniel praying and asking God for help. They went as a group. I, I mean, that just blows my mind. They walked in, they found Daniel praying, and they took some pictures and posted on Instagram was and hashtag so busted. <laughs> they wanted everyone to see that this guy was wrong. He's treasonous. So they went to the king and spoke to him about his royal decree. Uh, king, you remember what you said, right? He said, did you not publish a decree that during the next 30 days, anyone who prays to any god or human being except to you, your majesty, would be thrown into the lion's den? Can you see what happens? He says, he says look, 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 king, you said it. I got the pictures. We have the proof. I saw what Daniel was. He was actually on his knees. And when he was on his knees, he was crying out for help. Can you imagine these crooked politicians having no heart? They come as a group, and they see Daniel, and he's weeping on his knees, raising his hands to the invisible God. And there he's simply saying, God, help me. God, help me. I think just a normal person would have a nice, a, a warm heart and would feel sympathy, but not these characters. Ah, I got some help for you. And they went straight to the king and they said, you look, you had a, a decree and we got to get this guy. Before I tell you what took place after this, I got to answer the next question. And that is, what is the reason for a disciplined prayer life? When we ask, what, is the, what does it accomplish? I believe that it deepens our relationship with God. And so now we say, what is the reason? And I think it's right in this passage when we saw what Daniel was doing, and that is we desperately need God's help. Listen, the only reason why, the, the, the primary reason why we need, we get on our knees is we are creatures and he is the creator. We live in a hostile world that is surrounded by haters, both seen and unseen, who are attempting to take you out on a daily basis. You have to realize that all of us as humans are extremely fragile, hanging on a thread every single day day we need thee Lord I need thee every hour I need thee that is why we pray that's why we have a consistent prayer the problem is we don't think we need him and that's why we don't pray and sadly, sadly, I, and I, and I, you know, I gotta, I'm transparent. I'm telling you the things that have happened in my life. I worked in the school system, and I know got a lot of people in school system here today. Please, I don't want to throw into my pastor's card. So please give me grace, but I'm going to share you this story. Years ago, I worked in the school system. It was an alternative school. And it was a very, very difficult school, alternative school with school, students who were overage and many, many of them had been put, uh, expelled from uh, the general population, right? And so they're at uh, this school and every, almost every single day, every single day I went to school, they were calling me out of my name. Some of y'all know what I mean by that. Some of y'all younger folks know what I mean, don't you? When I was being called out of your name, you got that? Okay, I'm not going to tell you what they called. They didn't call me Mr. Tumpkin. <laughs> I'll tell you that right now. Every single day, they were opposing me. I mean, there were, there, there, were, there were rumors that they had a bounty on my head. I mean, it was tough. I mean, these, these kids, these, six, these uh, eighth graders were big as me. Some of them 17, 18 years old. It's the truth. It's the truth. And I had to, it felt like, I, and if anybody knows me, that I struggle with my temper. And, and don't start speaking out. I know some of y'all haters. I've been growing. <laughs> yes, he has, somebody said. Amen. And so for me to be going to that school, I just, I, and again, we have people in the school system. I'll admit I wasn't mature enough. I don't think anyone is. And so every single day, and my, my wife will attest, 
at 5 and 5.30 in the morning, I spent an hour hearing from God, singing to God, and praying, God, I need your help. I don't want to lose your witness. It's very easy. I, don't, I, I, I know that you've planted me here for a reason. I need to be filled with the Spirit. I need you to anoint me. I need you to be with me. And year after year, I saw that happen, God giving me help. But then there was a time when my granddad passed away and my mom was extremely ex sick, and that knocked me off of my square, and I'll, I'll admit that. It was very, very difficult for me. And I found myself not spending that time with God. And when that happened, then it was on and popping at that school. <laughs> to the extent that I almost lost a job. You ain't laughing now. It was not, it was very, very difficult for me. And I want you to know, I knew exactly what the problem was. I knew it every single day. When I would run out of the, the, the house and I was so distracted and I was not praying and asking God to help me, I knew exactly what was going on. As I was driving, I was thinking in my mind, I'm in trouble. I'm in trouble. I'm not spending that time with you. Because when I keep company with you, I become just like you. My friends, it's not just me. Some of us get up in the morning, jump in the shower, get our clothes on, run out, and we're not even thinking about prayer because in our heart of hearts, we don't think we need help. We don't think we need help. We think that we're smart enough to handle it. I wasn't. I was beat down. And I'm trusting that you see the real reason that we do this consistently and have a, having a routine is that we need God's help. Because we're not as strong and smart as we think we are. And the final question will be ans answered as we look at the other verses. It continues, then the men went as a group to King Darius and said to him, remember your majesty that according to the law of the Medes and Persians, no decree or edict that the king issues can be changed. Obviously, what happened during this time is that the king did not really want to execute Daniel because Daniel was very important in the kingdom and he was probably hemming and hawing and not handling his business. So the governors had to go back and say, do you realize that if you don't do what you signed in the law, then you too are become treasonous? Do you realize that, that you are committing treason? And so he had to act. So the king, in verses 15 and 16, so the king gave the order, and they brought Daniel and threw him into the lion's den. The king said to Daniel, may your God, whom you serve continually, rescue you. At the first light of dawn, the king got up and hurried to the lion's den. When he came near the den, he called Daniel in an anguished voice, Daniel, servant of the living God, has your God, whom you serve continually, been able to rescue you from these hungry lions who had not eaten? Has your God been able to deliver you, Daniel? And Daniel said in verse, he says, may the king live forever. <laughs> may the king live forever. In other words, don't worry, dog. I'm good. <laughs> D-A-W-G. Google it. You'll find out what it means. I'm good. Don't you worry about a thing. Oh, I'm sorry. It just, it just came to me. Didn't even say it at the first service. Sorry. He says, I'm fine. I'm all right. He goes on to say, my God sent his angel. And he shut the mouths of the lions. They have not heard me because I was found innocent in his sight. 
nor have I ever done any wrong before you, your majesty. What is the benefit of a disciplined life, a disciplined prayer, prayer life? If you look at Daniel's life, you realize that he was disciplined. He prayed three times a day, and he did not do it as a trying to make a political point. He did it as a normal way of living. It was his rule of life. And what was the benefit of it? And it's very, very simple, and it's this. We will experience a game changer. If you, my friends, get this, if you pray consistently and make a decision to carve all out time. It could be 15 minutes. It could be 20 minutes. If you do it, you too will experience a game change. Why? Because you will deepen your faith and your love and you will follow the Lord Jesus Christ and you will live a life of gratitude and God is going to step in. He's going to step in. I don't know how he might do it. It may be by just giving you peace. It may be by giving you power to go through it. But God is going to give you a game changer. I don't think Daniel just made that up. I think he got that from his great, great, great uh, grandfather, David. We find this in uh, Psalms 55, verses 17 and 18. Even mor evening, morning, and noon. I cry out in distress, and he hears my voice. He rescues me un un unharmed from the battle waged against me, even though many oppose me, even though there are haters. He says, I got to do this every evening, every morning, every noon. I got to do it because I need God's help, and I have to give my thanks to my God. I have to do it, and he says, he will give me a game change. He also says that in Psalm 5, verse 3. He says, in the morning, Lord, you hear my voice. In the morning, I lay my request before you and wait expectantly. You look, he says, I'm doing this in the morning. I do this all the time. I do this regularly. And as a pattern, I expect that you are going to move. I don't have this verse up here, but we see this in Psalm 91. He's, God was speaking. He says, because you have set your love on me. Therefore, I will deliver you. I will set you on high because you have known my name. He says, when you call upon me, I will answer you. I will be with you in trouble. I will deliver you and honor you. With long life, I will satisfy you and show you my salvation. What God was saying, even in Psalms 91, is if you put your love on him, you only set or show that you set your love on him when you consistently want to meet with him. And he says, therefore, I'm going to deliver you. I'm going to hear you when you call, and I'm going to set you on high. Because you know my name. But there's a couple reasons, my friends. You hear this, and it could be very, very theoretical. But the truth is, there are a couple reasons why people do not want to establish a rigorous regimen, a routine of prayer. First reason is, I don't have time for it. We say we don't have time. Some of us do, we say that. I don't have time. I mean, I have to rush in the morning to go to work. I get home, I eat some food, then I sit before ESPN, I'm watching The Real Housewives of Atlanta, I'm going to sleep, and I, I don't have time. I know that's an old movie, a show, you probably like something else today. But I don't have time for it, we say. How many of us say, when it comes to carving out time to meet God, how many of us say, we don't have time. The second thing that I think that people uh, think is I don't have, we don't have interests. In other words, it does not apply to us. Or I don't get anything out of it. I sit and pray, and every time I'm praying, I have no Holy Ghost goosebumps. And so since I don't have those, I don't really want to pray. And so I try for about a week or so, and then I say, well, forget it. I'll just go back to my little popcorn prayers, my Hail Marys. I'm not going to carve time for him. Not realizing is oftentimes God holds back his experience because he knows that you are going to give up. You hear what I'm saying? 
Sometimes we're looking God for God to reveal to us who he is, but he knows that we really, in our heart of hearts, we don't really want it. See, he wants us to be persistent and to dig in and to lean in. And when we do this and not abort this opportunity, God shows up. I think that we think that we don't have time. I think that we think that we don't have interest. But I have to say something to you that, that uh, as lovingly as I can, and that is you can't afford not to pray in a disciplined daily way. You can't afford it because we're creatures. He, he's creator. You can't afford it. So what should you do as the band comes up? What should you do? What, sh how, what should I take away and think about as it relates to having a disciplined routine of prayer? The first thing I think we need to do, we need to ask God to forgive us of our pride. You don't understand what I'm saying. See, the only reason why we don't pray consistently is we don't think we need help. That's pride. The only what reason why we don't pray consistently is we don't think that we need him every hour. Daniel understood that he was surrounded by enemies, both seen and unseen, and that drove him to pray and ask God for help. But us, we kind of think that we are all that. And I know about that. Because for years, I thought that I was invulnerable. I thought that I could just do whatever I wanted to do, that I can pick, uh, I can, I, everything I touch turns to gold. I thought that I was invulnerable until that fateful day when I found out that I had cardiomyopathy and I had two strokes. A 40-year-old, two strokes on my back. And that's when I realized that God is God and I ain't. Y'all get that later. That's when I realized that I'm really not that all, I'm not all that. And that time I started realizing that I got to come to you because I need thee. Lord, I need thee. Every hour I need thee. Bless me now, my Savior. I come to thee. That's the, that time I realized that I, I, I'm not invulnerable. When we realize that, we need to first come to God and say, God, I, I'm not praying regularly and consistently because I'm proud. I think that I can navigate through this life by myself. I'm smart like that. No, I'm not. And I'm asking you to forgive me. The second thing I, need to, that I want you to take away is you need to ask God to reveal to us our true humanness. What do I mean? See, if you ask him to forgive you of your pride, at the same time you say, God, show me who I am. <laughs> and see, when God tells, shows you who you are, then you'll hit your knees. But you need to do it right now. Don't wait. Because God will force it on you. And it may not feel good. I know. I experienced it. Right now, say, God, show me who I am. That without you, I can do nothing. Didn't Jesus say that in John 15? He says, without me, you can do nothing. We need, we need God, show me that without you, I can absolutely do nothing. I can't love. I can't speak. I can't serve. I can't uh, nurture my wife. I can't work at my job. I can't raise my kids. I need thee, Lord. Without you, I can do nothing. You won't get that until God shows you that you're not King Darius, Mr. Awesomeness. Mrs. Awesomeness. No. Scripture says we're broken jars. We're broken. And when we realize that we are broken, he, just like he 
puts us all back together again. And the final thing, let's start praying. Let's make a decision today. Okay, I'm going to write this down, and I'm going to carve out time every day. could be 15 minutes to pray. I'm going to thank God for what he's done. I'm going to uh, open the Bible to hear what God has to say to me, and then I'm going to thank God again for what he's spoken to me. I'm going to ask him to give me strength. I'm going to pray for my family and friends. And some of you say, well, I don't have the attention span for that. And I understand that because I'm in that boat too. So what, I, what, what you might want to do is start writing down your prayers and, and reciting them to God. It's okay. Just recite them to God. It could be 15 minutes. It may start with five. I don't know. But the more you keep company with God, the more you will go from an acquaintance to a fully devoted follower of the Lord. The more you keep company with God, the more you look like him. So let's start praying. And when we do this, my friends, God is not only going to give you a game changer, but he's going to change your environment. He's going to impact your home, your children, your job, your life. And I know this because we see this in this story. After uh, Daniel was rescued, not only did God give him a game change moment, but he blessed the entire world because the, dec the, the king wrote, signed in the law another decree that everyone in the kingdom must honor the God of Daniel. See, in other words, the game change is not just for you. It's for other people. It's for your family. It's for your neighborhood. It's for your city, country, world. So let us do this. Let us, again, start praying regularly and then expect God to give you a game change. Let's pray. Those of you who are here and as every eye is are closed and every head is bowed. Those of you who, who you don't know if you have a relationship with Jesus, you really need a game change right now. Maybe you're here today and you have not really committed your life to Christ. And you would like to be a fully devoted follower of Jesus Christ. And you feel like he's tugging you. He's speaking to you even in this Verse, uh, service. Well, I am going to tell you right now that that is the Holy Spirit, and He's saying you need to put your faith in Jesus Christ and not yourself because He is your Savior and He is your Lord, and He died on the cross and He rose again. And if you put your faith in Him right now, if you reach out by faith, He will give you a real game changer in that the old things will pass away and the new things will come. He will make you new. So if you're in that place and you would like to have this type of game change moment by becoming a fully devoted follower of Christ, I want to follow him today. I want you to raise up your hand so I can pray for you. That's simply what I want to do. I want to pray for you, and it will be an act of faith. Others of you, maybe you need to be restored. You've walked away from Christ, and you, and you feel like you have not been in his company, and you need to uh, be restored into, into his company Maybe you've gotten so distracted, but you're ready to shut out the noise and spend time with him. I want you to raise your hand, too. And don't be ashamed. As every eye is closed and every head is bowed, God sees it. Raise your hand if you would like to be restored or raise your hand if you would like to become a follower of Jesus Christ. And I want to pray. Father, thank you for those who have raised their hands. And first, I'm asking God that, that that person who reaches out and says, I want to be a follower of Jesus Christ, I need you, Lord, I need you. I pray, Father, that you will first give them a gift of faith. And I pray, Father, that they would turn away, as the scripture says, from their sin or repent and turn to you and say, I need you. Forgive me of all my sins. And I'm praying, Father, that, you, that they would reach out by faith and say, I need a Savior. I need a Lord. I need Jesus Christ, and I believe in you, Lord. I believe in what was said about you. You died and rose again, and I need you in my life. And God, 
I'm praying that you would give them a game change right now. For those who need to be restored, I'm asking that you would bring them back. For you're married to those who walk away. And you bring them back by your spirit. And when you do, I'm asking, Father, that you would not only bring them back, but that they would experience the joy of your salvation. And that they would begin to be disciplined in spending time with you and not allowing their emotions to dictate their devotion. I'm praying for this in Jesus' name. Amen.